Hi. Tangled's a good movie. Tangled's a great movie. I love Tangled. Weird that it's called Tangled. Have you thought about that lately? Tangled. Because she has lots of hair. It gets tangly. It doesn't even really get tangled. It's kind of like fluid and endlessly utilizable like a Spider-Man gadget. Tangled is a retelling of the Brothers Grimm story Rapunzel, released by Disney in 2010. They modernized the hell out of it. It's 3D animated and the princess is like quirky and relatable and the songs is catchy and it's got feelsy moments too if you're not repressing your inner child out of a misplaced need to avoid vulnerability. It's funny to watch now too because it's like proto-frozen, like the branding aesthetic bio-android preceding the full-blown cyborg of commerce. The film begins with one of the main characters recounting something like a fairy tale in voiceover. It explains how a pregnant queen eats a magic flower, naturally resulting in her baby's hair possessing the key to immortality. But the magic flower was this old lady's, like, favorite thing, so she steals the baby. Baby thief icon. <laughs> the narration concludes explaining that the king and queen created a holiday in their stolen-ass baby's honor, wherein the entire kingdom sends lanterns up to the sky on the stolen stolen ass baby's birthday as an act of unity and grief and also serving the pragmatic function of potentially being a beacon for her to come home. With this tragic tale out of the way, the movie now begins in earnest. The intro is 4 minutes and 16 seconds long and I skip it every time I watch the movie. Because doing this objectively makes the movie better. Buckle up, fuck nuts, we're doing Rapunzel Discourse. Part 1, fuck you. Mm, fuck you. I do not speak brashly or with arrogance. I mean it. Objectively makes the movie better. So calling art objectively bad is like a meme in online discourse now. I remember it happening with The Last Jedi and then more recently The Last of Us Part 2. Cause sexist people don't like things that have the last in the title. It starts off with somebody being like, come on, this is objectively bad. Like for example, let's take Ab Soul's verse on Smoke Again off a of Chance the Rapper's 2013 mixtape Acid Rap. The deep dive on Tangled is coming up, but first we're talking about rap technique cause the only way I know how to think is by weaving disparate media and concepts together to find deep deep meaning out of the mosaic. I'm like a light side Jordan Peterson. There's a particular lyric from this song that people talk about sometimes. No doubt like Gwen Stefani's group. Let me put my mouth where you potty, boo. If there were ever a time to say pause. So the way the conversation goes is someone takes that bar and they're like, Come on, that's objectively bad. And your gut is inclined to agree with them. And then someone who loves this song and feels attacked or hypothetically stands this particular lyric for some unbeknownst reason, they come through and they're like, that's just your opinion, man. Nothing in art is objective. All of it is subjective. You're just saying your opinion as fact to make yourself seem real smart and authoritative. Bottom line is creativity, taste, and interpretation are all subjective properties. And so my appreciation for the potty sex line is just as valid as your distaste for it. And then your gut is like, wait, that seems true too. But I'm super smart and I'm gonna dismantle both of these people until they are nothing. Okay, here's the disappointing thing. The potty sex line is actually fairly technically adept. By which I mean Ab Soul is a practiced lyricist who's good at his craft. No doubt like Gwen Stefani's group is a perfectly serviceable cross-cultural reference in the form of pseudo-simile that Jizza pioneered mostly on Liquid Swords. Basically a rap line that's like X is Y, like Z. My opinion is ideally in this formula, X and Z are related in some fashion, and in that the thing that you're comparing X to adds some sort of extra meaning to the bar beyond just being a pun. But Jizza barely did that, and so Absol doesn't do that, and that's fine. Styles are old like Mark's sneakers, lyrics are weak like clock radio speakers. Like in that one. Also, Mark sneakers, clock radio speakers, it's just fun to say. That's an underrated thing that people don't talk about very much in rap music is people just using words that you haven't heard rapped before, things that are tasty to say. Wu-Tang is crazy at this. Okay, but coming back to the potty sex thing, the other thing about the line Gwen Stefani's group is that it's a three-syllable assonant rhyme with potty boo. And multisyllabic rhymes being woven through different sentences of completely different words in ways that have never been done before is really important in rap music. There's also just the slightest bit of alliteration with the, let me put my mouth where you Audi, which connects the two verbs in the bar. And then insofar as conveying meaning, I mean, Absol has correctly articulated what he meant to say perhaps in a slightly less erotic fashion than he had intended. And so what I just did is an objective analysis of these lyrics. So I agree with Mr. Subjectivity that they're not objectively bad. However, I disagree with Mr. Subjectivity that there is no such thing as objectivity at all. This subjective objective dichotomy is something I have a lot to say on and I'll probably do a video on it soon, especially if people want to see it. But for the purposes of this video and this channel, what I'm chiefly interested in is objective analysis of things in concrete terms like functionality and text and not so much offering my opinion. This is not a drama channel.
yet. So that's what we're gonna do now because I believe and can argue for removing the first five minutes of this movie, bolstering the emotional weight of it from a functional perspective. Part two, Tangled is a mystery movie. Having a quick introduction to a fantasy world is not unheard of. It's very useful to get some of the exposition out of the way when the context is required for the audience to buy into the universe, especially when there's characters inside of it that know things that we don't know and they're not gonna sit down and start explaining stuff to each other because that doesn't make any sense because it's obvious to them, but we're just coming into it. It helps us gain our footing and get on with the interesting stuff. But here's the thing about Tangled. All the information that is satisfied by the intro is also functionally satisfied in the course of the movie. And not only that, but the way the information is doled out is as fulfilling narrative promises that are made at the beginning of the movie. When we go in blind, there's lots of questions that arise naturally from just watching the movie and not understanding things immediately. And every single one of those questions is answered with tension and drama and excitement of revelation. We open on a strange and charming set piece. Bitch is up in a tower. Her best friend is a chameleon. She's an autodidact polymath. One of her myriad skills is painting and her favorite thing to paint is something lights that rise out of the horizon magically on her birthday, like an annual constellation. And evidently she's never left the tower in her life, but we're not really given a reason as to why. I mean, what the fuck is going on? Then we meet her hippie mom, who's a little mean, but great fun. And then we see that she does some sort of magical thing with her hair, but that's also not explained. We do find out that she's forbidden to leave the tower because supposedly the world is very dangerous and scary out there. And this girl's gonna get her shit rocked if she steps out. But is this true? And why does the hair glow? And what are the lights? Fuck you, next scene. Thieves are stealing a crown from a castle and then running away from the cops. Flynn Rider said, fuck 12. If you think about it, this movie's anti-cop for most of the runtime, which is funny to me. <laughs> so our other protagonist, Flynn Rider, is running away with his two little thief buddies and then he betrays them and sells them out so that he can keep all the money to himself and save his own ass, which is bitch behavior, but he's got funny nose jokes, doesn't he? Horse dog mercenary Maximus hunts for him and Flynn runs away and falls off a cliff and should have died. And in order to get away, he slips into a little nook and it leads him to the valley that the tower is located in. Flynn then just climbs the whole tower, which is interesting because the whole original fairy tale was predicated on the fact the only way up or down through the tower was with Rapunzel's hair to the point that a plot point was that Rapunzel couldn't escape the tower because she couldn't use her own hair to scale down. But in this manifestation of the story, Flynn scales that bitch twice and Gothel Loki just got like a door and stairs in there. So Flynn gets in through the window, Rapunzel gives homeboy a concussion, and this is our inciting incident. Before we move on, let's take a quick intermission to take stock of the amount of times that Flynn definitely fucking dies in this movie. It's in that pot, isn't it? Gentlemen, please, because you look... Why, why do I need to keep my knees apart? Okay, so Rapunzel hides the dead body in the closet and then Gothel comes home and they have a fight about whether or not she can go see the lights on her birthday and what the lights even are. Rapunzel, dead set on seeing these lights on her 18th birthday, kind of manipulates her by asking for a birthday present that is far away so that she'll be gone for a while, conceivably so she can sneak out and get back in time. In the midst of all this happening, at one point when Gothel isn't there and the dead body's in the closet, she's going through the dead guy's shit and she sees the crown and she tries to wear it in weird ways because she's never seen a crown until she finally puts it on her head and she has this moment before she shoves the crown in a box because she doesn't give a shit about the crown she just wants to see those lights so steel from the rich anti-cop icon Flynn Rider wakes up and he's tied up in Rapunzel's hair tangled if you will and our protagonist threatens him with the weapon and holds his property hostage with the condition that she will let him go with his stuff if he takes her to see the lights on her birthday very cool it's a deal plot begin a key piece of information that we gather from the scene is when she asks him to take her to see the lights he goes you mean that lantern thing they do for the princess two things about that first of all Fun world building. It's a holiday that the whole land celebrates, but he's a lowly thief, and so he just knows it as that lantern thing for the princess. The second thing is at this point, you might be thinking, okay, CJ, just because you own a thesaurus doesn't mean what you say is interesting. I mean, mystery movie, really? Everybody with a brain has already gone. The lights happen annually on her birthday. She had that little moment with the crown. You mean that lantern thing for the princess? Rapunzel is the princess. To which I say, sure. Maybe. How much of the obviousness of all of this is stemming from your prerequisite understanding of the story of Rapunzel? And think about how all this is reading so far without the first five minutes. We haven't seen the king and queen. We only barely know about the cop state that exists outside of the tower through Flynn's perspective. We still don't know what they mean by lantern thing for the princess. We've only seen Rapunzel's painting of this thing. And of course, we don't know how the separation happened in the first place. There's a lot of questions to answer here. Also, without the intro, we've never seen Rapunzel in a place that isn't the tower. And I, I want to see that. And yeah, what I'm saying is that I include seeing her 
her as a baby in the intro is her outside of the tower. I am baby blaming and I am proud of it. I'll go right up and shake that baby's crib and be like, you're breaking my immersion. And so they depart on their quest and tomfoolery ensues. We learn more about both of them as characters, blah, blah, blah. Am I right? Fuck character development. We're just plot. Things develop, Gothel catches on to them and she wants Rapunzel to come back to the tower with her. Still motives technically unknown. The cops are looking for them, but nobody in the bar is a fucking snitch. Cause we don't talk to cops in Corona Kingdom, blue lives matter ass bitch. Their wacky misadventures lead them to a dam for some reason. This set piece is really out of the blue if you think about it. And the dam breaks and they get trapped in a cave and they're both gonna fucking die. And right before they die, they confess things to each other. So Flynn says, my real name's Eugene. And then Rapunzel says, my hair is magic. And thank God someone acknowledged it because we haven't heard anything about this magic hair since back in the tower. And she sings the incantation that activates it and the hair guides them out of the tunnel. And now we get a drawn out scene where we explain in detail her hair, its properties, its powers, and its weaknesses. This is payoff for the question that was posed at the start of the movie when we kind of saw this magic happening in passing. This is more of a side note, but I really like Rapunzel's character in this movie because she's not just superficially independent. She also genuinely has that spirit and resilience to make decisions and stand by them. When Gotham comes back and tries to fuck with her head by giving the crown and being like, yo, give your boyfriend the crown and he'll probably abandon you. Rapunzel, although you see all the doubt and fear registering on her face with her words, says, no, he won't, I will. She remains unmoved by the song Mother Knows Best's derogatory reprise. Next up is the Corona Party. Not, not that kind of Corona party, not this Corona party is great. All of Corona Kingdom is celebrating in anticipation of the night where they send the lanterns up in the sky as celebration. Although I do feel like they kind of ripped off that Kingdom Hearts level. And go figure, Rapunzel's doing really well in this environment. She's thriving, she's having a good time. I'm living for it, we stand. Here's Rapunzel and Eugene hiding from the cops again, hashtag ACAB. I also want to shout out this scene that we never see anyone talk about, which is her and Eugene seemingly pouring over history books? So I guess that's the moment where she's actually researching about the history of the kingdom and learning things about the world. It's a really beautiful single shot without explanation and there's a lot to infer from it. There's a euphoric dance montage and Rapunzel does that art that she used to do in the tower all on the ground and it's kind of strange how Rapunzel's artistic proclivities are so synchronistic with the aesthetic of what the people do at this celebration. That also just happens to be on her birthday and this shot is... What is this? A king and a queen with their daughter. A daughter that they lost. If I were a tourist, I'd be entranced by this piece of local lore too. It's so dramatic, so foreign. And at the end of this lovely montage, Mrs. Tangled and Mr. Concussion have the romantic boat ride and they finally go to see what the celebration truly entails, the lights. But now we cut away from our protagonists to the perspective of two characters we have never seen before. There's no dialogue in this scene. It's just a mother and a father grieving quietly holding on to a scrap of hope. Whatever it is that happened, it broke them, and they're doing their best to turn it into something beautiful and useful. Then we're back to our main characters, and Rapunzel gets to see the thing up close that she's been dreaming of seeing her whole life. All right, so we're pretty deep in this movie, so let's take stock of what's happening. At this point, Rapunzel still loves her mother. They're in a fight, but ostensibly, after her birthday celebration, she's going to try to go home with her boyfriend and reconcile. After all, even think of the language that she uses when she talks to her mom. You're wrong. She thinks her mom actually believes that it's too dangerous out there and she's mistaken. However, this takes a turn when mom goes full dark side and somehow manages to portray three people simultaneously. Gothel pulls some sneaky tricks to get three different people arrested. The worst thing you could possibly do in this universe, snitch to the pigs. She shows up to ruin Rapunzel's birthday. Her web of lies and manipulation have been spun effectively to the point that Rapunzel thinks herself abandoned by the person she trusted and she turns to her mother and tearfully runs to her arms. You were right, mother. I mean, what a whirlwind the last two days have been for her, poor girl. It must be a little comforting to have your mom there to make a little sense of it all. Then back at home, the last petal has been pulled from her hair. Her mom is about to make her dinner. She's returned to the safety and comfort of her own small reality, free from chaos, free from anxiety. And then I recognize that motherfucking son. Drama. This is the moment where this Disney adventure movie transforms into the myth of Rapunzel. Can we talk about catharsis? Textually, so far, this movie has been explicitly only about letting your guard down, learning that your parents can be wrong, shit like that. That tiptoeing towards remembering something finally turns into a step and everything that's felt wrong and everything that's felt right finally come in harmony together. And in that space of clarity where she finally unlocks her childhood memories from before the tower and she connects the dots and everything snaps into place and she has the answers, there's only one question remaining. 
Who is this bitch? Part three, what remains unexplained? It's the final question that has not been answered. How did Rapunzel get to the tower? Who is Gothel? It's textually unclear. And once more, I must draw your attention to the fact that you're coming into this with a prerequisite understanding of the story of Rapunzel and that first five minutes of exposition. Let me ask you this, Mother Gothel's a sorceress, right? No, she's just an old woman. We only think she's a sorceress because we know she was in the Brothers Grimm story. Even in the opening monologue of this movie, they don't say that. They just say she's an evil, greedy woman that wants to use the magic flower all to herself. So we have no fucking idea who she is right now. Can we talk about the flower for a second? Let's, let's talk about the flower. The opening five minutes of this movie have been cut and the flower does not exist because after the opening monologue, the flower never comes up again because the flower wasn't that fucking important. In our reading of the story, Rapunzel's hair powers are 100% serendipitous instead of the result of eating a flower, and it's functioning identically. In fact, removing the flower actually makes Gothel even less sympathetic than she theoretically was beforehand because she kind of had that flower under a basket, didn't she, in the monologue before it was whisked away by the rich. But the only thing we know now is the psychological horror of realizing that mother is just not mother. She's just someone that wanted the power and kidnapped the baby. So there's two sources of evergreen wonder in this universe now. There's the complete miracle that is Rapunzel's hair power that does not require explanation. And who is this bitch? I find the open-endedness of these prospects to be very compelling. Anything that you could lose from skipping the first five minutes of the movie is gained by the power of its absence. You could say that in the voiceover part, we see Gothel singing the song that activates the magic flower power, which explains how Rapunzel knows the song. But how does Gothel know the song? The point is it doesn't fucking matter and that song isn't even the only way to activate Rapunzel's powers because her tears also have the power. Rapunzel's just special. Without the flower, without the intro, we skip the bullshit and we commit to the wonder of the unexpected Explained, and we cut to the heart of just these characters dealing with what they're dealing with. The text sets up mystery and intrigue and then it delivers it in spades. For how obvious some of these answers might be to the audience, they're not obvious to the characters. And textually, it's not explicit until at the very end. Only in these moments where we see Rapunzel have spiritual unexplainable experiences and the world building working properly, do we actually have hints that lead us towards this conclusion. The nature of these mystery elements and the slow macroscopic coming into focus of the truth they represent Rapunzel having a slow spiritual awakening to something that wasn't just a rational connection of the dots, but remembering who she is and stepping into it. She has a personal revelation where she takes control over what's good for her and decides who is on her side. And it's not Gothel, and it's not the cops. So the point of this analysis is to demonstrate that the movie is 100% functional in terms of promise and follow through without having a big explanation at the front of the movie. The existence of Eugene's voiceover at the front of the movie takes us out of the perspective of the protagonist where the world is exciting and new and we have to subtly and slowly uncover the nature of this world until we discover that the world is not confusing and it's not new. It's beautiful and it's where you are from and where you belong. It's been stolen from you. I'm a lost princess. Oh, please speak up, Rapunzel. You know how I hate the mumbling. I am the lost princess, aren't I? Did I mumble, mother? I will take this opportunity in post to draw your attention towards the lyrics of the flower incantation, the song that activates Rapunzel's magic hair powers. We understand the lyrics, right? It's calling upon the mystic energy to heal wounds and reverse time, bringing back our lost youth and our loved ones. The subtext when it's sung for and by Mother Gothel is that she's using the power to alter fate and stay young and live forever. Rapunzel's hair is the flower and she calls upon it to defy reality and cling to the past. But when Rapunzel sings it, she's talking to herself. Gleam and glow, let your power shine, heal what has been hurt, save what has been lost. She's literally been telling herself to escape Gothel and go home to reclaim her life every single time she sung that song since she was a baby. It has nothing to do with the hair. The flower is her. Part four, the nose button. Back in 2017, I used to work at a day camp where I would hang out with kids and have to entertain them. If you've ever worked at a day camp, you know you kind of turn on this mode where you just be doing crazy stuff all the time to vex and confuse and entertain kids. You just act mindlessly, silly. So it was lunchtime or something and I went and I sat beside this seven year old kid that I knew and I was friends with and she's cool and she's funny and full on camper mode without thinking I touched her nose and I went boop hilarious right now she turns to me with this cub like excitement like I'm playing a game but I don't know what the rules are yet again I go boop well now I've attacked her nose twice she can't just sit there and take that so she touches my nose in return and I make a different noise boop we go back and forth like this a couple times boop 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 but then I hit her with a curveball I interrupt the pattern and instead of poking her nose back I poke my own 
Boop. Again, the child is vexed. What nonsense are you playing at now? Pressing your own nose when you should be pressing mine. So she presses my nose again. Boop. And then I press her nose twice. Boop, boop. At this point, she's starting to decipher the mysteries of the universe. She presses her own nose to see what noise I will make. And surely enough, boop. She's testing her two buttons going back and forth. Boop, 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 boop. And then, to my great delight, she does this. This blew my mind. I entered a battle of wits and was bested deftly by one I thought to be my student, my hubris crumbling around my ears. Look, the point is, kids are smart. Or more often than not, kids are as smart as you allow them to be. They will scream and run in circles for fun, absolutely, but also if you provide them a structured game that requires skill, they may enter it with equal fervor. So when a group of suits that don't care about people lazily throw a budget at something stupid and loud that signifies that it's entertainment without actually having anyone care about what it is, that's not making a story for kids. That's exploiting them. It's using their naivety so that adults can make money without doing anything. And I say, fuck the people that do that. Fuck them. Frozen 1 and Frozen 2 are spot 2 and 3 highest grossing animated movies of all times. Kids like good movies. They also like bad movies, but they're kids. We're adults. It's our responsibility to give them good art that's gonna last. Good art is a moral imperative, motherfuckers. My brother and I were real obsessed with Aladdin when we were kids. In the retrospect, we realized that part of it is it's the only person in a Disney movie that looked like us. But we watched it recently with adult critical eyes. Still fucking slaps. Cause people who made it gave a fuck. And now, a sharp detour into the narrative structure and world building of Miraculous, Tales of Ladybug and Cat Noir. Miraculous, Tales of Ladybug and Cat Noir starts episode one like it's season 14. There's a short little intro rehash where Marinette just explains that she's secretly a superhero and then the shit just goes. Two Parisian high schoolers, small floating creatures, villain in an aviary of evil butterflies and a Doctor Strange window. Akumas are evilizing, Hawk Moth is making persona contracts with Ed Lords to obtain Miraculouses. Mar Marinette is like, Tiki spots on, and Adrian's like, Plague, claws out. Marinette uses whatever a lucky charm is, and it activates a time limit on her superpowers. Adrian's little cat thing needs to eat smelly cheese, or he falls asleep quicker than a gay orphan. Marinette's like, Cat Noir, use your cataclysm. And we're like, what the fuck is cataclysm? She's got a yo-yo, she's got a stick. Could I make it any more obvious? They beat a villain and they snap a thing and a butterfly comes out and she puts it in a yo-yo and de-evilizes it and then yells her own superhero name at the sky and she heals the whole universe. She has unrequited love for him when they're in high school mode, and then when they're in superhero mode, he has unrequited love for her. I'm just like, Jesus Christ, it's a lot of information, and none of it is explained. Did you consider maybe opening with an origin story? Or even like a framing device, like a journal, just so we can be eased into it? But what you don't understand is that Miraculous is playing 4D chess. You quickly become acclimatized to all of these routines and powers and the names for things because it's such a hyper-repetitive show. Every episode, someone gets their feelings hurt, then a butterfly akumatizes them into a villain, and then Cat Noir and Ladybug have to save the day. It all starts to make sense. Cat Noir has the power of destruction. Ladybug has the power of restoration. The aviary guy uses the butterflies to access people's negative emotions and turn them into bad guys so they can capture those little animals that give the main characters their powers. They're called Miraculouses. And you learn all of this just through the repetition of watching the show. They barely explain anything. It's just something that you come to understand. So when the lore kicks in... So what exactly is so special about this book? Huh? It contains all the secrets of the Miraculous powers. It's sacred and extremely dangerous in the wrong hands. He needs it back. Just tell me what's going on, please. Who is he? The Great Guardian. And I think the time has come for you to finally meet him. Holy shit! I just accepted the established rules of the universe, finding out that there's an origin story and mythos involved with it was mind-blowing! And importantly, it's also mind-blowing for the characters. They've been running as blind as us. This just happened to them one day and they're doing their best because they just linked up with the Miraculouses and started saving the day because it was the right thing to do. They don't understand what's going on. So finding out is suddenly a thrill. This is what Tangled's like without the first five minutes. Guys, you gotta watch Miraculous, it's really good. The point is children's media can and should be good. Part conclusion, before you are dismissed, I must draw your attention to two things that did not make the final cut of the movie. The first one is a string of words I adore and I'm devastated were cut. Too weak to handle myself out there, huh mother? Well, the unconscious heathen in my armoire might disagree with you. Well, the unconscious heathen in my armoire might disagree with you. I'm gonna say that in response to everything. The second is like this concept sketch footage of Rapunzel being outside for the first time and she keeps picking up pine cones. Look, I found another pine cone. Wow, what are the odds of that? <laughs> I mean, this is so funny, like she's fucking 
picking up pine cones. She's never seen them before. <laughs> so I'm coming out of all this very pro tangled. It's a comfort movie for me. Like Kiki's Delivery Service is also a comfort for me. I like the movie. I want to eat the movie. I want to buy a DVD and take the disc out and put hot sauce and chop up parsley as garnish and put it on it and then I will eat the movie. Like we went through with my When Marnie Was There video, it is wholly possible and enlightening to engage with a piece of media in the most effective fashion possible. So I implore all of you to skip to 509 the next time you sit down to watch Tangled. I promise you it kicks this already good movie into the fucking stratosphere. And if you ever watch the first five minutes again, unsubscribe from my channel. I don't want you here. All my homies hate the first five minutes of Tangled. And we will close now by giving respect to Goffles priorities. Steal a baby, lock her in a dungeon, gaslight and neg her for her entire life, suck her life force for your own personal immortality, chain her and threaten her with violence, kill the ones she loves. But her birthday? What the? Well, you can't lie to her about her birthday. It's her birthday. I think I'm an addict, want the world and I'm a habit. I'm so fucking dramatic, got all my bones up in the attic and I dance them all around like a marionette. These earrings aren't mine. They're my mom's. I can't afford shit like this. Stay.